Our first reading this morning is from the second chapter of Mark, verses 1 to 12. It's found on page 969 in the Red Church Bible. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the word of our Lord. This morning's second scripture reading, also from the New Testament, from the book of Romans. We're reading from the first chapter of Romans, verses 8 through 17. And if you're using a red church Bible, that can be found on page 1090. Again, the first chapter of Paul's letters to the Romans, verses 8 through 17. Paul writes, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. May the Lord add his blessing. And I have nothing more to say, and here's a gentleman who has a lot to say. I'll keep it to a minimum. What I would like to say as I make my way up here, I appreciate the release from having to put on a mic. I'm going to be using this pulpit mic. So thank you for whoever made that decision up there in the audio crew. I appreciate that very, very much. 
And I will have to take out my notes because at the end I do need them. Uh, this Sunday we want to think about Mark chapter 2. That's our main text. And we want to journey to the town of Capernaum. And what I'd like to do is share three points under what I would call an introduction. People always want to know where's the pastor going, so I'm going to kind of let you know there's three things I'd like to say in introducing this text to you. And then we want to get on to our main theme of unstoppable faith, which begins with verse 3. So let me go back to the introduction. Capernaum, what can you tell me about it? It's what? The town where Jesus lived. Yes, he did move there from Nazareth. And he moved to Capernaum to set up his ministry for Galilee, for that big geographical area that we call Galilee. Correct? Great. What else can you tell me about Capernaum? Oh, I know you know lots of things. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll, yes, sister, go ahead. By the sea. Yeah. Hey, yeah, the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. All right, and I'll add something to the geographical area. It was on a major trade route. So it was a, became a very rich town. It was a large town. It wasn't just a little hole in the wall. It was fairly large. How about some people who might have lived there? Or, well, who did live there, not might have. One guy always shows up and he always has the wrong answer sometimes and once in a while he's got the right answer. Peter, yeah, Peter lived there with his brother whose name was? How about Andrew? All right. Yeah, they lived there in a the house. As a matter of fact, Peter was married. All right, anything else you can tell me about Capernaum? Oh, great. No, oh, that, that, this is great. It was one of the towns that Jesus cursed because they would not. Ah, die. yes. And this is the most important point I want you to take away, what this lady said here. It's interesting that Jesus did a bucket load of miracles in Capernaum. I mean, fantastic miracles. They saw but they did not embrace Jesus as the Messiah. They saw miracles, but they did not embrace the forgiveness of Jesus. They saw miracles, but they did not embrace the love of God. And as a result of this, we find these words written in Matthew chapter 11. And Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No. You will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. So it's incredible that all these things that took place in this town, the people didn't believe. It didn't touch their hearts. They saw it, and that was it. Even the story that was just read here about the, the cripple who was healed, it didn't touch their hearts. Okay, that's point number one just for an introduction to Capernaum. What I'm trying to do now is Whenever I come to a town or something, I try to find out what little things have happened there. Lord willing, the next time I'm back here, I'm working on a sermon of uh, the water turning into wine. And that happened in the town of Cana. And so maybe next time, think about what has happened in Cana that you know about. A couple interesting things. 
Well, I shouldn't say that. It's only mentioned three times in the New Testament. So that'll give you a little clue to look. Second thing I'd like to share with you is in verse 1. It says, Jesus entered again and came back to Capernaum. And he went into a particular house. We are not told whose house it was. We don't know if it was Peter's. We have no clue. There's just no way of knowing. But the important point that I want you to see is that whatever house that was had the presence of Jesus in it. And whenever you have the presence of Jesus, there is the possibility that you can be fed spiritually and that you can drink from the living waters. And so I would suggest to you today that as we gather here in this place, the presence of Jesus is here. He is with us. You don't have to pray for him to come. He is here. How do I know that? Well, I know that I am saved. I know that my wife is saved for sure. And whoever is saved, wherever they go, they bring the presence of Christ with them. So every saved person here today, you have brought Jesus Christ here. He is here with us. And because he is here, whatever your spiritual hunger is, whatever your spiritual thirst is, can be met this day. You don't have to go away not satisfied. If you do, it's your own fault. I like that last song we sang. God gives and God takes away. But it's up to our heart to choose whether we're going to bless God. It's up to your heart to choose today whether you're going to feed upon the bread of life, whether you're going to drink from the springs of living water. So Jesus is here as he was there in that home in Capernaum. Third thing I'd like to share with you comes out of verse 2 as an introduction. Scripture tells us that that particular house, we don't know how big it was, but it was overcrowded. Man, the fire chief would have been right down there right away to disband the crowd. They couldn't fit another person on the inside. As a matter of fact, the entrance to the house, inside and out, was blocked. Nobody could get in and out. And I'd like to suggest to you in my imagination, I see people standing all around that house, some of them looking into the windows, hoping to hear something. Because people came where Jesus was. Some of them that were there were just seekers. They never seen Jesus before. They never heard him before. But now they've got a front row seat with Jesus. Some of those people in that massive crowd there that day had come for healing reasons. They had something wrong with them. And they were coming with expectations that Jesus would touch them and make them whole again. Some of them were there because they really were interested in what Jesus had to say. Jesus had built up quite a reputation as a speaker. 
And so he was there to share God's word. And then there were some there that were the critics looking for Jesus to do something wrong so they could accuse him. And I think there are some there that just kind of got drugged there. <laughs> you know, kind of, well, hey, John, I'm going to hear this guy, Jesus. Why don't you just come along? Yeah, I got nothing better to do. Okay, I'll come. I think you probably had a few people like that. But as I read that part of God's word, thinking about that for a moment, about the crowds and about it being so congested, gridlocked, you couldn't move one way or another, I asked myself three questions. Has my lifestyle become a barricade keeping people from Jesus? Second question I ask myself, has my actions caused me to become a stumbling block for other people? And the third question I ask myself, has my words turned people away from Jesus? You see, we should always be trying to encourage people to come to God. But sometimes the way that we live, and I know I get caught up into that, and my wife is there to remind me once in a while, you know, especially when I'm talking to a professional that hasn't been professional. She says, remember, you got a testimony. And she's right. So as we gather here today, I would say, at least sometime today, go home and ask God to search your heart. To see whether or not you have been a hindrance to somebody in coming to know Jesus and growing in their relationship with him. See, we can't do it on our own. Because you know why? We think too highly of ourselves. Oh, that's not me. I would never do that. But really, if we get honest with ourselves, we can find times in our life that we have been that way. And we need to let the Spirit of God convict us so that we can repent, so that we can change our way, so that we can have a new heart towards that person. And so as we come here today, I would challenge you. I am challenged in that area as well. Now we come to verse 3. And verse 3 introduces us to five men. Five nameless men who have what I call unstoppable faith. Five nameless men. And I'd like you to kind of get yourself in the story here. This is a great story to kind of put yourself in it. And these five men believed that Jesus could heal the crippled friend. They were absolutely certain of it. And so they start off on a journey. Now it's important to remember, we don't know where they live. Did they live in Capernaum? We don't know. Did they live in another town? I have no idea. But they started on a journey of bringing this man to the presence of Jesus. 
Now think about it for a moment, if you will, with me. He's lying on a mat. Let's just pretend you've all seen those colorful yoga mats. Haven't you? You all know one? No? Yeah, all right. Well, use your imagination. Lay it out on the floor and then put me on it. And then get four guys to each pick up a corner to carry me. That is no easy task. It's not easy. And I will tell you this, that if I get on a yoga mat and you got four guys, I don't care how young they are, they can be in their teens, and you carry me from this church up to the parsonage, they're going to be tired. Because you got to walk and step. You just can't be out of step. you got to make sure I'm not going to slide off that mat. you got to hold me level. Now think about the fact that they had to go out to the highway, Route 44. Man, by the time they'd be out there, their arms would be hurting, their hands would be cramping up. And that's just a flat area. Now think if they had some roads like this to go up and down, carrying a man on a mat. So put yourself in the story. Here's these guys carrying this man, we don't know for how long, but they come into Capernaum. And things have been going great because they got there. They got there. And all of a sudden, they see this huge crowd outside of the house. And they can't even get to the doorway. The doorway is blocked. There's a gridlock of people that will not move. And it creates an obstacle. Whenever you're in ministry, there's always obstacles, my friends. And so they had an obstacle. And as they stood there, their eyes looked out over the crowd of people. But their unstoppable faith pushed them forward. In spite of what they saw, their faith said, keep going. As they looked out over that crowd of people, in their minds was this one word, impossible, impossible, impossible. And as their mind was shouting that to them, their faith was pushing them forward, saying, take another step. Their unstoppable faith. As they looked out over that crowd and they heard that word impossible and they saw the people, they said, man, I'm feeling frustrated right now. And besides that, I'm tired. But their unstoppable faith continued to push them forward and said, take another step. And then their heart was saying, oh man, let's give up today. We can come back another day. But their unstoppable faith said, no, we're going to move forward. And guess what? They moved forward. They didn't have a game plan, friends. They had no idea what they were going to do. They moved forward because that was the thing to do. And I like that about the story. I just wish God would have given us a little bit more here in the, in the Mark chapter 2. Because I'd like to know whose idea it was to put an open door on the roof. Where'd that idea come from? Picture them, they're carrying this guy. 
And they're wondering what they're going to do. And all of a sudden, somebody says, hey, let's cut a door in the roof. Where'd that come from? Only one place I believe that came from. God above. That came from God. Because God saw that these men had unstoppable faith. And they wanted to get their brother to Jesus. I wish God would have told us a little bit more. Because remember, these men didn't come packing shovels and things to cut through a roof. They didn't bring rope with them. They weren't planning on letting a guy down from a roof. They were planning on walking through a door. Where'd they get the tools? Where'd they get the rope from? I believe there was a little time out here where they set the guy down and said, all right, Levi, we got to leave you for a few minutes. We got to gather up some resources to do this job. And they went in the community there in Capernaum to gather what they needed. Now you can add your imagination to the story. That's mine. They get up on the roof. And I can hear one of them saying, boy, how risky is this going to be? We're going to cut a hole six foot long, three foot wide. Is the roof going to hold us? Good question to ask. But their unstoppable faith said, go forward. Another man was thinking, wow, after we get this hole in the roof, are we able, going to be able really to lower this man down and hold him? Can we hold the ropes? But their unstoppable faith said, move forward. As they begin to dig and make noise up there, they surely have thought about the intrusion Jesus is downstairs teaching. The Son of God teaching. And they're cutting a big hole in the roof. Surely they had to think, man, what's the owner of this house going to say? They were being antisocial. But their faith, their unstoppable faith, pushed them forward. And think about it if you were in the house. Jesus is teaching. And all of a sudden, you heard some noise up there in the roof. You knew it wasn't Santa Claus. It's not Christmas time. But there was noise and activity. And pretty soon, there's dust. There's particles. There's pieces of that ceiling falling down on you. What do you think the crowd was saying on the inside? Hey, Jesus, look what's happening up there. What's going on? All sorts of conversation was probably going on as these men continued to push forward and make a hole big enough to lower a man down. And then let me ask you one of the supreme questions. What did Jesus see? As Jesus looked up, he didn't see a hole in the ceiling. As Jesus looked up, he didn't see that man being lowered down on his mat. As Jesus looked up and maybe brushed some of that grass, that dirt, a twig out of his hair and out of his beard, he did not feel inconvenienced. But as Jesus looked up, what did he see? What caught the eye of Jesus? 
It was their faith. Their faith. Their faith. Does your faith catch the eye of Jesus? Do you have that unstoppable faith that regardless of what is going on or what the circumstances are, that you will press forward? There's a real challenge here, friends, because my Bible tells us that God has given to each of us who know Jesus Christ, we have been given a measure of faith. If you studied Romans, it's there in Romans. You have a measure of faith that God has given to you. The question is, why do we keep it corked up in our temple? When are you going to release that measure of faith? When are you going to release it so you can be blessed and God can be glorified? That's the question of the hour. It's releasing the unstoppable faith that's in you. You've got it. You just need to demonstrate it. And that's what caught the eye of Jesus, is these five men demonstrating unstoppable faith. Now what catches my eye is what Jesus says. Notice what he says there. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. Whoa, 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 wait, Jesus, you got it wrong. We didn't come for that. They weren't there for that, were they? No. They weren't. They were hoping to hear, Son, I'm going to completely heal you. But what is Jesus teaching us today when he said to that man on that mat, Son, your sins are forgiven. What is he teaching us? He's teaching us that Jesus wants to heal more than just your physical body. Friends, I share this every time I get a chance. Your body is nothing more than dust. Why do you spend so much money on it and time on it when it's only dust? You think about that. And I'm not trying to insult anybody here. I think we ought to look nice. But I think our culture today has gone far beyond trying to look nice. We like to look like we haven't aged a day. What Jesus is teaching us is that the most important part of who you are right now is not your physical body, but your soul. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You see, Jesus wants to heal our souls. You're going to get a new body in heaven. Don't worry about the one you got now. God's got a glorious body awaiting you. But you better take care of your soul. And that's what Jesus is teaching us here. When he says, son, your sins are forgiven. He's saying, I'm forgiving your soul of all the unrighteousness that is there, of all the sins that are there, they're forgiven. You and I need the forgiveness of God. 
The most important part of who we are, it's our soul. And when you die, it's just an empty shell that the undertaker handles one way or another. And I'm not trying to be crude. I'm just trying to be honest with you. Because who you are left that shell when you died. Your soul left your body. And God says that body's just going to go back to ashes. So for us today, the question is, what have I done with my soul? My soul is going to determine whether I go to heaven or hell. If it's been cleansed and forgiven, I'm heaven bound. If it's not, I'm hell bound. Now it's interesting, i got to wrap things up here, that as Jesus was teaching that, the religious leaders that were there that day understood what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, I am God, and I have the power to forgive. And in their hearts and in their minds, they raised some questions. And so Jesus said, hey, I know what you're thinking. But let me ask you a question. Which is it easier to say? You're healed? Pick up your mat and go home? Or to say your sins are forgiven? Well, they knew the answer. The easiest thing to say was, your sins are forgiven because there's no way you can check up on that. But Jesus said, listen, so that you might know that I am the Son of God and I have the power of God to forgive sins, I'm going to tell this man to do something that you can check up on. And so he tells the man to get off the mat, fold it up, and go home. And the man on the mat had unstoppable faith because he did exactly what Jesus told him to do. And I'm always amazed that he was able to get out of the house. Somehow, in some way, that crowd made a little path for him to walk out of that house. Unstoppable faith. Let me just stop my sermon right there and let me raise another question. What does that look like in real life? What does unstoppable faith look like in real life? Here we have a story from the Bible. True story. I can see it there. But let me just share a story from a lady called Jackie Kitchen. And she's a lady Karen and I met at Dunkin' Donuts. Remember that? She was working at Dunkin' Donuts. We talked to her, and she started coming to church and became a part of our church. Well, in August 11th, she wrote us a letter. And she says, I have a prayer request. Now, you've got to understand, I have permission to share this with you. I've already asked her. So... Um, there's nothing in here that's in confidence. Uh, so she's writing to me, and you know how you do emails. You never have complete sentences, phrases, all that kind of good stuff. So let me just give you the gist of the letter. And as I think about this woman, she is an example of unstoppable faith for me today of this year. She says, I have a prayer request. I'm going for a new job, all excited, waiting on background checks with COVID delays. I will be working for uh, a company that FedEx hires her out to work with. Uh, she'll be a security guard. And here's her dilemma. 
I am terrified to go before Mike Williams, who's the HUD manager of the entire FedEx. Uh, Ally, which was the company she was working with, wanted to give her that position, but there was probably an interest of conflict. So she says, I went to pray Isaiah 12 too. Trust in the Lord and do not be afraid. I was with tears that I asked Jesus to help me and to soften Mike Williams' heart towards me. I had no appointment and he's a very busy man. His secretary, Kim, uh, likes me and she texted him, I was waiting. I felt like Queen Esther going before the king. He came out and said, you have an appointment with me sternly? I said, no, sir, but I'd like to have a moment of your time. Sir, I need your help. I explained, and he took the card from my hand and gave me his permission to share my situation. I almost fainted. I couldn't believe it. Afterwards, I ran back to my prayer tree. Now, I've got to tell you, she has this beautiful tree. I'm not sure where it's located yet. We've seen a picture of it. And it's a tree where she does a lot of praying under. She sings songs to Jesus under that tree. So she's saying, I'm running back to my prayer tree. Uh, it's one of her places where she prays. And um, to, uh, to tell Jesus, thank you. It is my own private place to pray, sing, and talk with my Savior. Keep praying, still waiting for background checks. And then this is another one that came in a little bit later. Uh, praise the Lord, background checks are all in. I have to take a drug test and an eye exam. And, uh, and then the company will issue my security license. However, I can't afford to go to the Bill Ricca Allied headquarters because I don't have car insurance could not afford it. I will get liability insurance as soon as I get a few paychecks. I've only been able to work past few weeks because of my knee. It acts up. And so I contacted my pastor, Tim, and he said he'd make a few calls for me. All the really big news is that FedEx expedited my background check for this new job because of Mike Williams. Boy, when God softens a heart, he does a great job. I know God has covered me. I have no more anxiety. I am not to be afraid. I have learned these two things. God doesn't like his children frightened, and I'm not here to be a slave to anything. I just love that. Lady going that big guy, going with unstoppable faith, believing that God would do something, that God could soften his heart. For me, that's an example of unstoppable faith in the century in which we live. May God allow us to demonstrate our unstoppable faith in the days ahead. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for the measure of faith that you've given to us. God, help us to take it and use it. You want us to be people that walk by faith and not by sight. You want us to be people who live by faith. So I pray that in these days ahead, Lord, that you would give us the courage to take that faith, that unstoppable faith, and allow it to propel us forward, to take the steps, even when we're not sure we're even going the right way because we have no plan, we have no strategy. But God, you are in control. So God, use that faith in our lives for your glory. And we'll thank you 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.